I was thinking this week a lot about Jesus, as I'm sure that uh, you were, and uh, I was thinking about uh, Gethsemane, and I read in the book of John as I was kind of reading uh, all of the, the verses that we had scheduled this week, I read that Judas knew where to find Jesus when it was time to betray him and have Jesus arrested because Jesus always met there with his disciples in that place. It's like he knew where to go because Jesus had many times sat down in the garden of Gethsemane near this gotchim and this oil press on the east side of Jerusalem. I started, because I have these pictures in my mind, I've sat there 30, 40 times myself, and I've, I've often thought, you know, why, why did he pick this spot? What was it about this spot that, that made him, you know, want, want to be here and want to teach his disciples from this spot? Why did he come here often with them? And maybe, maybe it was the shade because that, that side of, uh, that's the Mount of Olives. So that side of town is covered in olive tree, trees. Maybe it was the God Shemin itself. It's a huge oil press, and there's actually, you could have gone inside of this, uh, this facility and found shade, and uh, maybe, maybe it was that. But I was thinking also that for the many times that he did that and the things that he taught his disciples there, as they look up from that place into the Eastern Gate, up to the Temple Mount, I have to think that he thought a time or two, one day the walk from here to there will be very different. And what we find in John chapter 19, as as John the disciple recounts this entire uh, episode from, from the arrest at Gethsemane to the crucifixion to the burial, is that Jesus was in complete control. There is a tension between, in these moments, a tension between his sovereignty and his humanity. And I really, I personally, I don't negate the fact that he was sovereign, but I personally connect with his humanity as I think about him walking from Gethsemane across the Kidron Valley into Jerusalem to be crucified. Uh, Crucifixion is a brutal death. I was looking at a picture this week. They they had uncovered a heel bone of a crucified victim, and it had it had the spike still through the back of the heel. Uh, So he they must have crucified them like this, you know through the heel that way. It's a death by asphyxiation, so you suffocate in your own uh, fluid. But before he even got to the cross, he was tied to a pillar outside of the Antonia, and two Roman soldiers took whips called Cat of Nine Tails that had nine leather straps each each one, and had woven in shards of Roman glass and bone and pottery into those those nine leather straps, and they took turns beating his back as he was tied and, and kneeling at this stone pillar where these things took place. They gave them 39 lashes traditionally because at 40, the, the thought is that the person dies. Many people... Uh, never made it to execution because they died at that stone, stone pillar. And so when you think about Jesus moving then after the, the scourging and walking to what is now uh, the area, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, but in that day, the, uh, the Golgotha, the place of crucifixion, uh, carrying his cross after such a scourge, you're talking about utter uh, pain. Um, not sure too many people could endure such a, such a thing. Uh, the Romans were 
experts at this. Uh, They were expert executioners, expert crucifiers. They knew what they were doing. And so at 9 and at 3, John says, they, 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 in 9 in the morning, they, they nail him to the cross. I have a friend, his name's Jerome. He lives on the other side of Houston. And he, he gets his shofar out at 9 o'clock on Good Friday, and he blows it in his neighborhood. People think he's an idiot, I'm sure. But he's, like, he's reminding us what Jesus heard at 9 o'clock in the morning as he was being nailed to the cross. Because at the pinnacle of the Temple Mount, they were blowing a shofar to announce the sacrificial uh, system would come to order. That the priest would begin sacrificing the lambs for the atonement of sin at Passover. And so while that shofar blew, which Jesus definitely could have heard. He would have heard he was nailed to a cross. The cross was not on a hill far away. The cross was at street level in a place called Golgotha, just outside the first century walls of Jerusalem. It wasn't uh, 30 feet up in the air where you could barely make out who he They did it to embarrass him, to say, this is what happens when you cross Rome, when anybody is Lord besides Caesar. They wrote uh, on his uh, a sign behind him so that everybody could read it. Hey, this is the king of the Jews. Look, the king of the Jews in three languages. Just to make sure everybody gets what happens. He was crucified as a criminal for insurrection. Nine o'clock in the morning, he hung there. And what I want to dive into for just a moment, it's two verses out of John chapter 19, verse, well, it's going to be verse 28 and 30. It's some of the last moments of Jesus' life before he died. And I'm going to ask you to stand as we read this. If you're our guest, uh, we say this phrase, the very words at the end of our major text reading, just to distinguish God's word. For my own. So here's what the scripture says. In John chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus is hanging on the cross. It says, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch, and they held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. You can be seated. What we might not pick up on in the English version here that you do see in the Greek version is that the derivative of the word in English finished is used three times in this, these two verses. If you just go there with me, I'll, I'll point it out. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, this is the word, it, it's the derivative of the word to telestai. Everything was finished, said to fulfill the scriptures. Now that, to fulfill, that is also a derivative of the word to telestai, it is finished. So it's, it's like to finish the scripture <laughs> over. He said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, to tell us thy third time. It's finished, it's finished, it's finished. And that word in Greek means fully accomplished or perfected, 100% finished. It's done in Texan, over. He knew that it was finished. He chose his words specifically to accomplish scripture. 
Do you remember there was a time where he sat with a woman, a Samaritan woman at, at the well in Samaria, and she came and he said, uh, can you give me some water? And she said, why are you even asking me to give, give you some water? I'm a woman, you're a man, I'm a Samaritan, you're a Jew, this can't happen. He said, woman, if you knew who was asking you to give him some water, you would say, give me water, and I would give you living water, and you would never thirst again. And the conversation continued, and it ends up, this woman goes back to her town in Samaria, and she tells everybody, Here's a man who knew everything about me, and he quenched my thirst. And, and, and she brings the whole town out to see him, and many came, and many followed him from that area. He says on the cross, it is finished, and he says to fulfill the scripture, uh, I, I thirst. Once at Sukkot in John chapter 7, the festival of Sukkot, when the high priest was having his moment with thousands and thousands of people gathered on the Temple Mount. He was holding up this pitcher full of living water that he had gathered to pour out a drink offering so that God would make rain and economy would come. Jesus stood up and cried out in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And now we get to the cross and it says, to finish the scripture, to fulfill the scripture, he said, I thirst. And it's that understanding in a picturesque way that Jesus, the living water, became thirsty so that we would never, ever have to thirst again. It's the fulfillment of all of scripture. You can follow the living water theme all the way to Revelation from Genesis. John loves this theme. He talks about it a lot. It's finished. It's finished. He knew that it was finished. He chose his words to perfectly accomplish the scripture. He said it is finished, but he didn't say it as like just anybody. He said it as the one who is the finisher, <laughs> the one who has the authority to finish it, to be done with it. He bowed his head. A lot of scholars believe John's giving us a picture of reverence. He gave up his spirit. That word is the same word for it, like delivered. He delivered his, his own spirit to God, to the Father. He gave it up. He gave up his spirit. And it just begs a couple questions. The first is this, what is finished? It's finished, it's finished, it's finished. What is finished? Well, a lot of things are finished in that moment. But here are a few. Sacrificial offerings for sin. When he says it is finished and he breathes his last, again, the priest is at the pinnacle of the temple blowing the shofar to say, let's slaughter the lambs. And Jesus is saying, let it be finished. It's finished. We don't have to slaughter lambs anymore because the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world has finished it. He is the once and forever and for only Passover lamb, according to the scriptures. What's finished? Sacrificial offerings for sin. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27 says, He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. He finished it. That's why they're not sacrificing. It's Passover right now. It's Passover right now. No lambs are being sacrificed on the Temple Mount. Why? Lots of reasons politically, but the bottom line reason is it's finished. It's done. Over. What else is finished? Well, the wrath of God that you and I deserved because of our sin, the sin that put us at war with God, the sin that we were born into, you know, sin is uh, becoming a less used, lesser used word in the English language these days. 
But sin is gravitous. It is full of gravity when it comes to our relationship with God. It separates us from God because he is so holy and we are so sinful that he must execute wrath. And he does it in justice. People say, God isn't fair. He's not fair. He's just. And he executes his wrath accordingly. And when Jesus goes to the cross and says, it is finished, he satisfies the wrath of God toward every person who would confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in in their heart that God raised him from the dead. It is finished. John said that was the propitiation, the substitute, the atonement, the redemption of our sin. It's finished. God is not mad at you, O follower of Jesus. He's not after you and your sin anymore. You're his kid because it's finished. Jesus took it. That was finished. What else is finished? Satan is finished. Death is finished. Hell is finished. The irony is in that moment, because Satan is not not omnipotent, he doesn't know everything, in that moment, he thought he won. He thought it is over. But in reality, what the scripture teaches us is that in that moment, as Jesus delivered his spirit, gave up his spirit, bowed his head in reverence to finish the scripture, became thirsty so that anyone who was thirsty could come to him and drink. He was thirsty for them. In that moment, it actually was the beginning of the ultimate victory that could not be reversed. In that moment, he reversed the curse of sin and death. And he sealed Satan's fate. And the end of the Bible tells us that Satan and death and hell are all thrown into the lake of fire and judged. In that moment, it was finished. Completely and totally finished. O follower of Jesus, you will never experience the judgment that is, that is eternal separation from God. That is hell. You will only experience what it's like to die and pass straight into a judgment where Jesus says, I've clothed you in righteousness, that you are right before God. You are one of his kids because of that bloodshed on the cross. Your sin has been forgiven, but not Satan, not death, not hell. All of that is finished in this moment. You know what else is finished? My quest to work my way to God. You know, people are trying to be good enough to get to God. They're trying to be religious enough to get to God. They're trying to do all kinds of things to get to God. And, and it, on the cross, in that moment, in the first century, just outside the city walls, when the shofar blew and Jesus gave up his spirit, it was finished. Do you know that I don't have to strive for God's love? Nor do you, O oh follower of Jesus. You have it. You have his full love. It is finished. You're not trying to earn it. You're not trying to be in his good graces. He has graced you completely through the blessing of the shed blood of his son, Jesus. What else is finished? Well, my thirst is finished. Your thirst is finished. Everybody is spiritually thirsty. We're wired that way. We intuitively, we get that we're sinners. Every person gets it. They do things that that isn't right. They might not have a moral compass. They might say they don't believe in God, but everybody has moments in life where they realize, I messed this up, and I can't fix it. And they have They have intuitively, because we were designed by God, they have this thing that says, I'm thirsty for something, and that's why they they make all these different ways to God, and it was in that moment on the cross that Jesus quenched my thirst and every follower of Jesus' thirst for eternity, the scripture says. I don't have to be thirsty. I can drink as much living water as I want to all day, every day, because I have access Not because of anything I did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. He finished it, and he quenches our thirst. Revelation chapter 21, verse 6, 
the end of the Bible, John, again, John is having a vision of what it is at the end, and he's told to record all of these things by Jesus himself. And John, John says in Revelation 21, 6, and he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end to the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. It's free. It's free. He paid the price, ultimate price. And for you and for me, it's free. It's done. And we can drink as much as we want of that living water. What is finished? All those things are finished. And many other things. But those things, they're finished. Why did he give up his spirit? Why did he do that? If he's the sovereign king of the universe, why did he do it? John chapter 10, verse 18, it says, no one takes it from me, Jesus talking. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down, meaning his life, and the authority to take it up again. He is sovereign over all of it. His own life he's in charge of. None of you had any choice about your birth. None of you have any choice about your death. You, a follower of Jesus, the moment your heart stops beating, you're completely dependent on God to bring you to him. You're completely dependent on him in faith for everything the Bible teaches. You can do nothing about it. But Jesus is the only one that said, I, I give up my life and I can take it up again. So why did he give it up? If he's that powerful, if he has the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again, why did he give it up? And there's really a short answer for that. Love. Love. It's John, again, that writes in John chapter 3, verse 16, when he heard Jesus talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, how do I get to heaven? He said, you've got to be born again, man. Nicodemus was like, how do you be born again? I'm old. Do I have to go back into my mother's womb and be born all over again? That's ridiculous. And Jesus is like, you're the teacher of Israel. You don't understand anything. And then he said these words, for God to love the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. Love. Why did he give up his spirit? He gave up his spirit for love. John also says, greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. He delivered it up. He laid it down on his own accord and took it up again. Why did he give up his spirit? Love. Last question. What about us? What about you? What about me? What about us? John chapter 19, verse 35, it says, he who saw this, he's speaking of himself, he who, was, who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows he's telling the truth. John often talks about himself in the third person, like the one that Jesus loved, like the one that beat Peter to the tomb in a foot race, like the one who saw these things and knows he's telling the truth. He knows he's telling the truth. Why? And the verse goes on, that you may also believe. What about us? Well, again, very short word, one word answer. This whole thing that John wrote, that he penned, that he recounted, that he witnessed, that he lived, that he saw. I mean, you think about John for just a second. John was the one, while Jesus hung on the cross, that said, hey, this is my mother. She's now yours. Take care of her. We have evidence that John later was in Ephesus with Mary. He took care of her, according to his own testimony, till the, the, the day she died. This is, he, he smelled the smells and heard the sounds and all of it. He sat in the Gethsemane under the trees and heard the lessons. He saw the arrest. 
He saw the scourge. He saw the beating. He, he walked the walk. He saw the crucifixion. He saw Jesus laid in a tomb. He saw all of that. And he says to us here in 1935, uh, I saw it. I bear witness. This testimony is true. I know I'm telling the truth. Why? That you may believe, that you may also believe like I believe, speaking of John, like I believe because I saw it. So we must, when we answer the question, what about us? We have to only, only say that this must mean that we too must believe. That, that's what it, it means. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I've been crucified with Christ. This is Paul's writing. I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me in the life. I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul's saying, like, when I believed, I considered myself crucified with Christ. When I believe, I I decided it's no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I'm still stuck in this flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I owe him everything. Paul says I'm his doulos, his bondservant, over and over. I'm chained to him. I'll go where he goes and do what he says do, even if it causes me calamity, chaos, and killing. A lot of times, you and I, we come to moments like this, and we have this tiny little Jesus in our pocket that is like, if we get in trouble, we'll pull him out. And I'm telling you, the sovereign king of the universe, who had complete control over his life, hung on the cross in a timely fashion because he loved you. And John said our, our pure response to that should be we should pistuo, we should believe. It's a, it's a Greek word, pistuo, that means believe. It's kind of like believe with your feet, not with your mouth. Anybody can say anything. Where are your feet taking you because you believe? See, I'm glad you're here tonight. The call at the foot of the cross is to come and die. Christianity is not easy. Grace is free. You are fully loved by God. But Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, Luke 9, 23, take up your cross. You've got your own. Deny yourself. Follow me. That's the kind of belief we're talking about. That's the kind of the belief the, the, the Bible the Bible points to. So when I go back to the garden, before he was arrested, and I think about Jesus sitting with his disciples, they're around his feet, he's teaching under these olive trees, and they're just soaking it up and talking and listening and laughing and having fun. They have no idea he's going to make that walk. But he does. He does. Because he's fully in control. And he absolutely loves you. The message of the cross is the most beautiful message of love that has ever been or ever will be. There's none like it. There is none other like it. Jesus said, I'm the way. I'm the truth, I'm the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. Would you just bow your head, close your eyes. Jesus. Our love is um, feeble toward you in comparison to what you have lavished us with.
But we do say in all of our humanity, we love you. Thank you for the cross, for the scourging, for enduring the audible of that shofar when everybody was looking at the other lambs, and you were the Lamb of God. For despising the shame, for being mocked. for becoming thirsty so we would never have to thirst again, for delivering, for giving up your spirit. We say thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for atonement, redemption, the forgiveness of sin, the mercy and grace, the righteousness that we're covered in by your blood. Thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.